taking notes. I, I, I thought I could trick you. <laughs> yeah, you can. You know what I laugh at? I'm looking at that picture right now and I'm realizing that actually looks like you. Like that could, that could be you in the background oh, if you look at it. Fuck. Isn't that not crazy? Yeah, and I trimmed my beard today. Yeah. Especially. Okay, now I need you on that. I need you on the, the mouse because we're going to do this quickly. Today, we are on with Daniel. What are you doing? Go on, continue. <laughs> <What are> you... <laughs> You're switching because you don't want to see yourself in the background. Not like that. Uh, today, we're on with Daniel Fisher, and we we're going to discuss. He's a PhD, an MD, several Ds behind what he's doing in his life. We'll talk about that. And we're going to discuss how I recover from schizophrenia. And we're going to do that. Where, Bambos? On oh, a wonderful chaos. Oh, wonderful chaos. Okay. Nice. Andy, Andy, Andy. Yes, Bambos, Charles Demetrio. Andy came to my house for breakfast today. We had a two hour walk. Yes. Two hours, right? Two yeah. hour walk. And I did another two hour walk after I left you. So I did wow. 25,000 steps today. I'm very proud of myself. I can't tell. Yeah, you can. <laughs> There's a lot more steps needed to get rid of that belly. I can tell you that now. Uh, I've got a lot of steps ahead of me <laughs> and a lot less food intake. Um, today, we have Daniel Fisher for a half hour. So we're going to continue the discussion afterwards. Yeah. Um, and I, I was really excited about this topic. And I've really been excited because I've always seen this boundary between, I don't know what we'd call it, a mental breakdown or schizophrenia and what I would call a form of enlightenment. I always have a hard time using the word enlightenment because there's so much projection into that yeah. word and there's so much meaning that's inferred. But like, like the mental breakdown, like, Everything around me is a construct. And it, and how do you come to grip with that? Well, somehow the whole construct falls apart in front of you. And then, you know, so mental illness is kind of a weird thing. You could say mental illness is one step to enlightenment. And, 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 so, and I don't want to use a big E word here. I want to use enlightenment in terms of when one has a state of clarity, which sees through its current context. So seeing beyond the reality that it now has in front of its face. So what Andy's actually saying to everyone watching this, except for Daniel Fisher, mm. we're all mentally ill. Yeah, that, that was my point. My whole point, I see, I like Daniel Fisher in the background. I like when we get to talk about things and the people aren't on and we get to see their faces like, well, I don't know if it's that. Well, I mean, because he's a PhD and, and the big D's on the back. So in a weird way, he has definitions for these things. We have vague ideas that we carry out. And, yeah. and my vague idea is that if we understand that this world is a construct, all of a sudden we have the potential to behave differently in it. If we don't, then we might let society dictate who we are and we're confined often to society. So it's a question of how far do we go through that? And then is, 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 is a moment of schizophrenia even required? I mean, that's another question, but I think the question is what is the breakdown that allows you to see through your current, call it paradigm of living, and that would be something I'd love to dig into with uh, with Daniel. Just a quick, just to this, just it's nice to give a prelude because we do have an accomplished person on the show today. Yeah. Not like there aren't a lot of accomplished people, but today I'm just going to read this. Dan's life's purpose comes from his lived experience of recovery from schizophrenia, which inspired him to dedicate himself to helping others find their voice and recover. He earned an MD and, a, and completed his res residency in psychiatry <laughs> at Harvard Medical School and has practiced as a board certified community psychiatrist for 30 years. And then it goes on. He's done a lot of different foundations and, and diff different commissioners from the president onwards. And we're going to do that one. We did that already. Didn't we? <laughs> you're trying to mess with, You're trying to make me schizophrenic. We're going to bring him on. We have him for 30 minutes. So we're going to enjoy the 30 minutes then continue after he's exactly. gone. Exactly. He's got a course to teach. He's got real work to do. And we're going to do that one. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Uh, Hello, Andy. Hello. <laughs> how how was the introduction for you? Yeah, where was I wrong? Oh, I don't know. It was intriguing. Um, I, I like the the playfulness of it. Uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot we don't know, a lot we don't understand. Uh, yeah. I I don't know if I would say everyone's mentally ill, but I would say that we're all in 
in a way in our own realities and yeah i mean we construct our realities and if we construct them then we can reconstruct them and yeah yeah and what, what, what oh, sorry yeah well, question and andy often says that m we live in, the, in our heads a lot of the time so and andy sees the mind as a lot of noise a lot of confusion yeah i would agree with that i mean it's yeah. um and i i mean i just give you briefly sort of a um an overview of what i went through as um I just see all the D's that you were mentioning. Yeah, I was, uh, <laughs> the only believer. D's I got were grades in school were D's. <laughs> well, I was um, I was a believer. Um, my father's a doctor, uncle, brother-in-law, grandfather. Everybody mm. in my family was a uh, some type of medical doctor. No psychiatrist, mm, yeah. though. Medical doctor, and I. I believe that the world was constructed, you know, sort of linearly and molecularly. Yeah. And um, and my father, my father did very important research um, on penicillin during World War II. He helped mm -hmm. um, develop, you know, through Johns Hopkins, uh, a mm -hmm. lot of the protocols. And penicillin actually saved my life when I was a year old in 1944. Wow. It was still very experimental. And And my father said... Uh, and I had very serious pneumonia and I was in an oxygen tent and he said, give that boy 10 times as much penicillin as wow. you usually do. And that was because he'd been doing studies in the laboratory on tolerance to, you know, doses of penicillin and, and I pulled through. So my mother joked after that, she said, you know, I'll never worry about your father being late for dinner because <laughs> <laughs> he always tacked on his research at the end of a clinical day. He was a clinician wow. and a researcher. That was in the days wow. when you could could actually be both. Yeah. But I um, I was very very moved by my father, and uh, I worked for him one summer when I was fifteen in uh, his laboratory, and um, and he was he didn't say a lot about you know well, you should do this or should do that, but he used to really say biochemistry was the future, and mm. um, and then I was in college. Uh, and, and I have a younger sister who's had quite severe problems uh, emotionally, and, and, mm. and we really wanted to help her. And I kept thinking, well, it must be biochemical, because that was mm. 1962. I mean, it actually could have been 2021. And yeah. um, they still believe that it's a false, really false belief. But I, um, my father got me an interview with a uh, psychiatrist actually um, at, at National Institute of Mental Health and um, Seymour Caddy, who was at the top of the field. And he said, oh, you're a smart young guy. I was 18. He said, why don't, why don't you go into biochemistry you know, and get a PhD? And I hadn't really thought about it. You know, yeah. I just wanted to be a medical doctor. But he, he was very convincing, gray hair. You know, I, I thought yeah. at that time, gray hair meant a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and As I we all do. Books. <laughs> yeah. And so I went and got a PhD in biochemistry and uh, and then I got a job. He said, come back here and you get a job at NI NIMH. He was gone, but I got another jo but job I mean, with someone else. When you were doing biochemistry, you were also doing a lot of drugs at that time. So you were already experimenting. <clears throat> Yeah, I was doing personal biochemistry. <laughs> <laughs> and and in that experience of doing your own biochemistry, were you basically discovering things that you also saw were beyond what you were studying in school? Oh, yeah. I mean, were you, beyond, uh, beyond the laboratory. At that point, I was actually doing, by day, I was doing research at this and at National Institute of Mental Health on neurotransmitters and, you know, very orderly, mm -hmm. linear and then by night, I was living in DuPont Circle area of DC, of DC, which was a very happening area in the um, 60s, 70s. And um, yeah, I was I was taking, I took mescaline uh, mm. and a couple of times. And and I remember thinking, you know, we'll never understand and attest to what goes on in a person's consciousness, never. No. And I felt I had to leave the laboratory, but I couldn't do it easily. I I I'd worked so long and so hard. So I did this reconstruction you were talking about. I was like, oh, I'm going to just look at the world differently and mm. just only trust what I see and feel and hear. Nice. And not, not what I, um, you know, just what I read about. Yeah. And that, that led me to silence for quite some period of time. Wow. Uh, 1.5 weeks. 
Silence. What's that? Silence. That led you silence. to silence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it led me to silence because I was like, man, I really got to reconsider. Now, I, I wasn't like consciously saying this to myself. Uh, if I had, I could have said, okay, that's enough silence. Uh, I don't really want to go to a psychiatric hospital and, you know, mm-hmm. have drugs put into me. So, but I, I got to a point of silence that I couldn't get out of it. <gasps> oh, wow. And that's that's sort of the dividing line between, I'd say, between enlightenment and uh, and and a severe <sighs> psychiatric problem. Oh wow! How old were you, Daniel? I was twenty-five. Oh, I had wow. gotten my PhD at twenty-four. I was in a real <laughs> hurry, and then I joked that I was in a hurry to, you know, go into another reality too. Yeah. And so I so got the, in, I couldn't get out. I, what, and what I found was that it was, I had to have other people to come out. I had yeah. never really realized how absolutely essential um, human relationships were yeah. until I was in that other reality. And, and the only people that could reach me is, is, is my second hospitalization was six months. And the only people that reached me initially were people with less uh, training, people that yeah. just were. You know, they, they, they didn't try to even force force me to talk or ask me yeah. a lot of questions. They just were with me. And I and I kept thinking, there must be something terribly wrong, wrong with the training here because the more trained somebody is, the, the less, less, the less effective they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, the second book was only, <clears throat> I just wrote a, I wrote a book where a lot of it was just about holding space. And just mm. the capacity to hold space mm. without need, desire, mm. and that that the, it, can that be enough was the, really the question. And in most cases, I find it it, it is. It's yeah. a little bit like um, when someone is trained, then they're not so present because they have an idea of how where to put you. Well, yeah, yeah. they preconceived, and so they're constructing your reality for you in a way. Yeah, yeah. and you feel it. Yeah, all of us who are sensitive <clears throat> feel it. Honestly. So. I have a funny experience similar to yours. I was a drug addict for 10 years. You were what? A drug addict. Uh-huh, and okay. from the age of 15 and at the age of 25, I overdosed. Like I took a lot of LSD for quite a, I think, I don't even remember for how long, but. Two months, you said. I, I stayed in the trip for two months. And I, wow. and I was telling Andy, I, I could no longer distinguish dreams from reality like i couldn't separate anything anymore it was mm. as if someone took the ground from under my feet and i, I was even sharing with him mm. like sometimes if i see a movie and i see someone cutting themselves yeah i never did that but i could i could see how that would bring me into my body like i would really hold myself mm. and people would hold me so i wouldn't mm. but I, I i had the tendency to trash my apartment mm. to get more in my body um and at some point I had an epiphany in that trip, which brought me out immediately. Mm. And, Did and, pe- other people play a role <laughs> in helping you come back? Uh, there were two people in my life that comforted me. Mm. Mm-hmm. But I had a hard time receiving love anyway in those times. So it wasn't easy for me to uh, be with them. Like mm. love, love is as interesting. You mentioned love. I think it's very, it's very essential. And we, we always romanticize it. And someone says love, you think immediately it must be, you know, erotic love or something. But yeah. the Greeks had <laughs> so many words for love, so many different types of love. Erodas, and, agapo. <laughs> yeah, what's that? Erodas, Erodas. agapo. Is that the what? language of? Is that in Cypriot? Yeah, oh, it, yeah. it's Greek. Oh, it's great. And, and mm. what's the what what's the translation? Uh, erodas is in love or make love. Agapo is it's more heart connected love. Mm. Mm. Well, it, it's, it's yeah. Engl- I always yeah, found the English language really, a bit limited mm, to translate. Yeah, mm. yeah. I think the English is very limited. It just has one word that tries to be multi purpose, but. We so so just sort of fast forward. I um, when I was in the hospital, I got this idea. I didn't share it out loud because I probably wouldn't have gotten out of the hospital. And that was I'm going to become a psychiatrist. It was while I was locked in seclusion one time. Yeah, I was too happy. You can't be too happy. 
when yeah. you're in a hospital, you know, they think you're manic. And I was just very happy because I'd had a pass. I'd gotten to go to my lab, which I really wasn't liking my lab, but it looked great after being <laughs> locked up in the <laughs> hospital. Like, oh, and I came back and they said, how are you feeling? And I said, well, on a scale of uh, one to 10, I feel 11. And they're like, you are going into seclusion. <laughs> so I can laugh now, but at the time I thought I was dying. I was like, oh, yeah. shit. And then I just, and I, and I lost consciousness actually in there, but just before I did, I went, I did two things. One was I sort of imagined I was a bluebird flying out of the window. So mm. I was like saving a part of myself from this yeah. experience. And then I said, if I ever get out of this, I'm going to become a psychiatrist and get the keys and, and unlock all these uh, locked facilities. How beautiful. Yeah, it's been hard, though. I mean, I got through, I think, the, the, it, I'm not saying it was easy to get through medical school after that and to yeah. get my do my residency, but the really hard part has been trying to uh, convince policymakers that, uh, you know, that, that it's better not to have people in locked facilities. It's everybody's yeah. afraid. They think, oh, you know, people are going to be dangerous. It's, the most dangerous people are the people that haven't been labeled mentally ill often they're the yeah. more dangerous yeah they, you know you know the policy in the netherlands is very much to let all the people that would normally be in psychiatric wards live in the city so mm -hmm. if you're in the city and there's a lot of social housing in the netherlands or in amsterdam especially you kind of know each social house has one wacko <laughs> And, or, and, or one no, or one known whack. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, one that everyone yeah. knows about. And every six months, yeah. the police get called. They get dragged off, <laughs> and they go away for a week or two, and then they come back. Basically, they put them back on their meds. Right? That's normally the, mm -hmm. that's normally how it's treated. And then they kind of sustain for another six. But there's a very much an integration of whoever would normally be secluded from society is actually welcomed in. It is a very interesting uh, system to see well, that here. Yeah, I'm. What I've worked on is, um, I mean, I worked as you've mentioned as a community psychiatrist, but my real love has been to create alternatives um, to the psychiatric system, and mm. and I I started a center called the National Empowerment Center almost thirty years ago, and um, I then through that have promoted policies of um, self determination integration mm. and community supports that are so that if somebody you know is is wobbly they don't have to be dragged off the hospital but mm. people actually come and support them uh, yeah. where they're living and prevent it but the best prevention really is uh, where as many people as possible learn to interact with um, each other and with the person you know in distress in a new yeah. way and that yeah. means really retraining or reteaching society. And that's where emotional CPR comes in. Yeah, we started it um, about 13 years ago as an alternative to something called mental health first aid, which is really just reinforces the labeling system. And instead of you know labeling people, we feel you know people should learn to be more comfortable when somebody's you know in another reality. You can learn yeah. a lot from them. And people need to be comfortable with their own distress in order to be yes, with somebody. To, to make, it's almost like I'll often say, if you haven't made peace with the thing inside yourself, it's hard to help somebody else make peace with that. Oh, so yeah. Um, yeah. so I've got a question for you. So I, I'm in a situation at the moment with one of these, the, these, these people. So the man has gone into the manic phase. Like he's gone into the, he's up sure. all night beating on the mm -hmm. floors. And it was interesting because my mentor who died uh, 10 years ago, he lived in the building, which now somebody else lives in. And he would always walk upstairs and treat him with real respect. And he would never be angry and he'd say, you know, David, it's really hard. We're trying to sleep. And then in general, because he was treating him with love and respect, David, who would still be in his manic state, would in general do better than what he was. Well, that's that's very essential um, is to be able to see the humanity in the person and yeah. recognize that they're still mm -hmm. there. They're still present. In fact, the part of the person that's the most um, eager to grow is mm -hmm. often the most present. It's just that that part is not just, you know, is not recognizable either by the person themselves or by another person. 
And there's a great um, quote. I wrote a book uh, called um, Heartbeats of Hope. And uh -huh. uh, I could just read you one little quote Please. from it. It's from a, a Belgian minister or priest uh -huh. who just spoke spoke his mind in um in i think it was the 60s actually his name was uh lewis Evely, and he didn't write anything down he just spoke yeah. and um he has the most wonderful um a friend of mine sent this quote to me years ago it says loving people means summoning them forth with the loudest most insistent of calls it means stirring up in them a mute and <clears throat> hidden being who can't help leaping at the sound of our voice, a being so new that even those who carried him didn't know him. Mm. And yet so authentic, they can't fail to recognize him once they discover him. To love someone is to bid them to live, invite them to grow. And mm. that's really the theme very much of our emotional CPR is to help people to open up their own heart so they can be with people. And yeah. um, and really that nourishes people's soul and, yeah. and their their sense of self can grow because what, and what prevented me, I think, from getting out of my silence um, was I didn't have enough sense of self that I could sort of say, yeah, I'm taking a break. Yeah, it might take, you know, a couple of months. Yeah. I got to reconsider my whole life. Yeah. But you need a pretty large sense of self to do that. Yeah, you do. To contain you need it. To know, you need to know what you need, that you need that, and you need to be able to declare it and not think it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And to yeah. be with people that, that recognize that too. Yeah. And you're mentioning space. Uh there's one recently we asked, we ask people often to reflect what's helpful in emotional CPR because it's really we just we just try to help people be with people, not to fix them, not to do, not to label, just to be, to be together yeah. with them, which means being together with yourself while Obviously, you're with the other yeah. person in a way that you're not in such distress that you have to fix really yourself. But yeah. this woman, she put it so well, a young person in Scotland, we do this now you know, all around the world. And uh, she said, you know, with emotional CPR, it expanded my sense of self. And I just mm -hmm. thought, you know, by being with another person, she said, I can experience parts of myself I hadn't, I hadn't been able to experience before. Yeah. And can, can we set this down a little bit? <clears throat> yeah. What, what, can we you say we want to slow down because there was someone you were saying they caught him. Um, like what you just read um it almost feels like if you don't treat people with compassion and love like i just noticed i start to feel suffocated when i don't have that feeling mm. 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 interesting yeah so when i heard you read that text it really uh, hit me well um, the idea that we're carrying around a mute being is is pretty to me, pretty profound, yeah. Because we we think we know ourselves, but we really don't. There's yeah. always a sort of a, a a growing edge that's beyond the words, beyond our constructs. And and if if and it is a dream-like state, I think, and art and music uh, tend to draw it out. But if we don't allow ourselves to be in touch with it, we die. I think. Yeah. So we can't overly think. Uh, makes it hard to write about actually and and with emotional cpr we 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 don't we, we have a resource book we call it but not yeah. a manual and it's um and we have intentions we just have seven nice. intentions and the, yeah. the first first one is uh to be with the person as fully as possible and we we draw on the um the chinese character for listen which is nice. eyes ears and heart to listen mm -hmm. with your eyes, ears, and your heart. Your heart is really all your senses together. And to really, really be able to be there as attentive as possible. And yeah. then, and equally as possible, you see the, the other person as as equal with you, as a source of um, information. And then you start to experience feelings in being with that person. It may not be the same feelings, but you start to experience feelings. But making space for those feelings within yourself first um is very essential because if you just respond right away you're mm. 
reacting and reflexively and not yeah. uh, responding from a, a place of, of being centered. And yeah. then to respond is very important though. And that, that gives, I think, the person a feeling that they exist, that, they, that their existence matters to you because yeah. you're affected by them. And yeah. emotions actually um, in psychology are called affects as it is. And mm-hmm. it's, I, I don't love that word, but it is like you're if you're affected by another person's uh, emotions. Yeah. And then we say, be, don't do, be, don't do. Mm. And that's very important because you everybody has a tendency to want to fix somebody else when they see them mm. in distress. But the yeah. fixing comes from within the person. So then we say, the, the fifth intention is really we'll explore the unknown together. I don't know the answer. I'm not an expert in your life. You're an expert in your own life. Yeah. And that's recognizing and validating that they have the power to heal within them. And yeah. then when that happens, we mm-hmm. have the R, revitalization. So we say CPR is connect, empower. We cheat a little bit power p yeah, yeah and then r revitalized to bring we actually do feel that we bring people back to life and some people will yeah, say yeah. yeah it's brought back to life yeah so i can imagine that that's the book right there Eight Eight piece of of hope. Hope. yeah beautiful some someone told uh told me that uh listening to my talk gave them extra heartbeats of hope nice yeah, I was as you spoke. Uh, uh, the way you spoke to really resonated with um, how I've kind of come to my own journey. Because uh, as I think you read a little bit when we discussed prior that I did this tour through the U.S. where I just sat with sixty groups and said, "Write a t- letter to a loved one as if it's the last letter you're going to write them." And what I noticed is that before each session, I felt exactly the emotion that I was feeling, which was always hard for me to allow, because it was so deep and so painful, that I would cry pretty much each session. So I wasn't a facilitator. I was an example of the thing I was inviting them to join me in. Mm. And, uh, and and what I noticed is that we got to very deep places without even knowing one another just by being that example for them. And and as you were just mm. speaking, you know, and, and I kept saying on the trip, it, love has to be enough. If, if, if it has to be more than that, then, then I'm not in for that. This isn't my trip is only to be here in love and that's it. And that was really the, the journey as it was that, uh, that, that I could certainly identify with the words you gave to that, to that experience with ECPR that you're doing. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, um, it is profound. Um, someone just that I work with as a trainer also said, isn't it amazing? You can be with a group of people for just 12 hours and they can share so deeply in ways that in therapy they might not. And and quite a few people say, gee, I didn't share like this in therapy. And I think one of the reasons is that in therapy, there is this distance as people are taught, the therapist is taught not to share. And that's terrible because we're not suggesting you share your whole life story. But your feelings and your authenticity as a person is like a role. What? How did you put it? Uh, your you role be, model. It, it's, it's Gandhi. Be the thing you want to see more yeah. of in the world. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm always frustrated when people throw vulnerability out and saying you're not being vulnerable. And and I'm always laughing at the paradox that at that moment they're not showing any vulnerability, which is exactly what they're asking of from the other. And it's like, guys, don't you see it? You're not so so share with the person what it means to you and why you're what the problem is, and then let them meet you there. But Andy, it doesn't work that be way. Be vulnerable, please. <laughs> um, be, you, I want you to be vulnerable. I'm not gonna be vulnerable. Yeah, no, no you. Uh, um, we have we have yeah. a que- I, I'm aware of the time and I see yeah, Bulalang has a question. Well, is one of our regulars Bulalang says under what circumstances is emotional CPR given? Does a person have to train not to understand what is emotional CPR? Well, first of all, it's in, we feel it's intrinsically in everyone, the mm-hmm. capacity to assist. And in fact, animals often do a better job than people mm-hmm. uh, because they are by nature nonverbal. And um, people use horses and dogs and mm-hmm. cats, all kinds of um, therapy animals. Um, so it's it's really... 
the learning of it, of emotional CPR, is to peel away a lot of the artificial constructs of uh, civilization that say, you know, you have to, you know, just think in a linear fashion wow. and stay in your head. But we say fog that out a little bit and just allow mm. yourself to experience often in your body. Um, mm. It's really for, we feel it's for anybody to help anyone. And it, it was yeah. developed by people like myself who went through very severe experiences mm. and, um, and, and, and can have been able to come back by saying this is what we wanted when we were in those states. Wow. People yeah. with, who've been through lived experiences often do it better because you're not as frightened of other people's you know various realities if you've been in a variety of realities yourself yeah, you can understand it yeah, yeah. by the we've come Probably. to we come to our half an hour i'm conscious that you have yeah. a, a course I waiting do. for you we thank you we thank you very much for the half an hour yes thank you okay Daniel. well thank you thank you very thank much yeah, we look forward to uh, possibly another show. There's things that you said that uh, I, 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 my brain exploded when you said animals have more ability to be compassionate to humans and other humans. And it dawned on me, that's why I like animals so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay, you. Okay, well, take care. Yeah, Thank you. I'm leaving now. Bye-bye. Yes, bye. Bye. Enjoy your course. Bye. Wow. That was really, there was a lot of things that, came up in me as I heard Daniel speak just now. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I, I related to you. We, I had, uh, I never saw it as a mental breakdown, but remember in the last letter <clears throat> when I discussed Case, my mentor who those who watch know that Case had a big impact in my life. There was a moment when I was not, a, I, I was blocking myself from seeing this identity of Andy. So I, I was, we all do it, right? We all are not in touch with all the parts of ourselves. But at some point, Case was so rough on me. And in the book, I described it in such great detail that a lot of people were put off by Case. Like they, when they read that chapter, they said, this couldn't be a nice man. But Case really said, you're an imposter. You know, you try to pretend that you're someone you're not. Everyone sees through you. When you say this, when you say that, so it was just really banging, banging, banging. And like when he did this, I had like, I would call it a, a, a cute mental breakdown. And I went home and I started to fall into sweats and I was under the covers for two days sweating. I didn't eat for two days. Like I just, I just sweat. And it was this, and it was like weird, the weirdest experience. It was as if I had a cold because it was almost like my whole cellular, my whole cellular system was breaking down and reformatting. Like it was like all these things that I wasn't seeing in myself, totally confronted in the most uncompromising of ways. And then I remember like the third day I kind of came out and it did feel like a rebirth. But the weird thing was, is that we went right into a meeting with some man who was really judgmental towards case. And now you mean after the two days, right after the two days. So I'm in this meeting and my heart is broken open and I'm with somebody who's projecting and having a lot of aggression towards him in, in, in this. And, 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 and I didn't have the barrier that I'd normally have because I was broken so open that I started to feel everything on visceral strong. Like it was like, wow, you're, you know, you know, where might have time I might have uh, it, it would have been something I would have noticed and I would have been able to park it in my head and then deal with it. Like I couldn't I couldn't deal with it was six. It was raw and real and in my face and it was overwhelming. Like I couldn't. It was almost like uh, vibrating. Like, I don't know how to interact with this anymore. It was it was like my system hadn't yet learned how to process this flood of information I was now receiving because I broke down all my barriers. So now I could feel so much more, but I didn't know how to deal with the feelings that were coming in. And I remember just leaving in shock. Like I felt like I got to be more gentle about how I reenter society because mm -hmm. I just couldn't, I couldn't take it. And, and in a way, you know, we talk a mental breakdown. This was certainly not the worst of the mental breakdowns, but as he spoke, I realized, wow, that was, uh, one of these breakdowns when you really are, you're not certain of anything anymore. 
and you're because everything is so raw you don't know how to process it yeah that was something that came up for me as we as we spoke for you because we, we did only have them for a half hour the things that came up we didn't get a chance to dig into i i felt a lot like uh, i had tears in my eyes but it was overwhelming to be with him mm. and what about what about it was overwhelming I have no idea oh really like i i I I, st I just stayed present with the tears as opposed to trying to understand them. But I, I just felt my body contracting. Contracting. Yeah. I mean, we've often discussed about the contracting when people talk about psychedelics. Was it that kind of experience or or what do you associate that contraction in yourself well, with? When I um, spoke about the, like, I, I could feel what it's like to not be seen with love and compassion, to feel that suffocation. Ah, uh, and I just, I, I stayed, I, that's, I, I stopped listening after that. Like I just stayed with that feeling. Oh, wow. Cause, cause I guess for those two years or however many years you were living as an addict, people would have treated you less than human a lot of that time. Not that I was aware of. Oh, not that you're aware of. Okay. So where where were you because that, that now uh, I'm, uh, that's what i interpreted so what was it then like i said i have no idea oh you know i idea. just i just recognize but if it, it, this is what we'll do sometimes if you had to guess what would it be nothing's coming nothing comes up okay no oh, interesting yeah i mean when we were on our walk today and you told me in the most visceral way, when you were doing the psychedelics, you said, I was in a taxi on the floor. Like it was, it was, you shared an experience where I felt the experience in me as you, as if there were six things that happened. And from in your mind, the time of the switch was literally seconds. It was like you open your eyes, you're in a cab, you open your eyes, you're in a club, you open your eyes, you're in bed. And just nothing made sense. Like at some point, it's like, oh, you've got my tattoo. I remember this, like in a club. You've got the same tattoo as me? And I really freaked out in the club. <laughs> um, yeah. It, it, it almost feels like, like I said, you, you almost want to hit your head on the floor to wake up yeah and you did that you I, said yeah you would literally hit your head on the floor that's wild um i typed out a few things that i thought would be interesting are you okay by the way yeah okay good um you know it's good to discuss this as well um so when daniel fisher talked about those subtle clues the unspoken clues like, you know how much, like when we're walking on the street, like I'll kind of talk to every dog that we pass, our cat. I've seen you do that. Yes. <laughs> and when he said that there was a compassion and a love and, an, and a capability that existed in animals that it, it, it often mm. doesn't exist, I could easily identify with it. And that's, that's what you see in my love for animals when you commented on it today. It also makes sense why people... Uh who are not feeling okay, yeah. they, they normally tend to have an animal. Yeah. And you notice that those animals, and you'll see it when they record it, it's fascinating. The animals have such an acute sense of what that person's experiencing. They know mm -hmm. exactly what to give them to help them ground or to sort of, sort of help them through the hysteria that they might have or the manic phase they're hitting. Yeah. So, in, in that way that Daniel spoke, and, and I'm assuming we didn't go into it, and I see Bolalong says, there's an unfinished finished business here. We, I feel that we have more information. That's obvious, Bolalong. But there is an aspect of the human's inability to feel the other's experience because they're shut down in themselves. And as he said, it's it's innate in the animal, and that's how they survived is by sensing what's going on. That is their acute ability. And of course, that's why they make such great uh, uh, comforting uh, comfort for the people who who you know when you see a, when when you see a, a, the owner of the dog cry, and then the dog comes to the owner to to console it. Yeah. yeah. 
So yeah, that's just uh, that that fascinating. I mean, I can imagine in the eCPR work, Jessica DeFries, who was the one who suggested that I'm sure that she was very much in tune with that aspect of of my work. And I'm clear that that's also a reason why she would have wanted to have him on to have that discussion. Yeah. I had a funny, um, I wanted to do a few, because I knew that we were going to have a half an hour. Uh, and so I said, let's type out a few things so we might have a discussion around them. So I was going to read some of those out, or one of them. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> what's, okay. What's going on? Oh, I was observing you because we've discussed it sometimes when... Um, when so so you had an experience with Daniel, and that experience touched you on such a level that you stay with that experience, mm -hmm. and then and then we'll talk after the show and and we'll say what happened. You'll say, well, that experience was so it, it hit me on such a level that I wasn't able to move past that experience. Mm -hmm. So I see it in you now, and uh, and I'm and, and I don't actually say problematic, but I just well yeah, and, I, and these are the moments where you talk more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then I told you today, I said, oh, when I see you there, I'll carry the show forward because I see interacting with you, you'll give me responses like, yeah, nothing. No, it was, it was a fine. I liked it. It was just, yeah, it's good. And then I'll be like, okay, so let's go on to the next point. <laughs> Take it away, Andy. <laughs> and and it's okay. But it's I think it's nice to talk about these things as we do the show. Yeah. Because um, some people might not know that the dynamic of between us, how it works, is that if you uh, if you're more in tune with what the jive is of a show, you might talk more. And if somehow you get pulled in, then I'll sort of pull more, and I'll just do more of the. And I think it's nice to share that. Yeah. Um, each week, spiritual teacher Deepak Chopra responds to Oprah.com users' questions with enlightening advice to help them live their best lives. <laughs> How do you like that, Bambos? So this is the question, okay? It's from an Oprah Winfrey listener. When I was 18 years old, I had a deeply spiritual experience that led me to a psych psychiatric hospital. They told me I was schizophrenic. I had other involuntary admissions after very spiritual experiences. And my diagnosis is schizo affective bipolar disorder. I was young and now I wish I did not tell the doctors of my spiritual encounter. I have a hard time rising above the stigma of mental illness. I'm now 31 and the last couple of years I've been reading about enlightenment. My experience has no different, was no different, sorry. I felt extreme bliss, every nerve ending pulsed in my body. I experienced so many coincidences beyond any reasonable explanation, but my location was in the West, not the East, and this has affected my whole life. Is there a line between mental illness and enlightenment? Wow. And Deepak Chopra responded to this. Yes. And Deepak Chopra responded to this. Okay. <laughs> like, like, let me guess. What is that? What is that? Like, what are you going to guess? Like... I, I kind of feel a little bit allergic towards. I know. Chopra. I thought you would. That's why I loved saying his name out loud when we so, said it. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of uh, like when I hear him talk. Sometimes I just can't connect to the guy. Oh, really? So I'm wondering. No, I'm really curious if he's uh, able to hold that space. Interesting. I don't know. I mean, I. You know what I always find is that everyone will speak uh, enlightened phrases and words and, and and statements. So I don't have any uh, any aversion to him. I just think, why is he any more special than any of the 100 other people speaking with why statements, right? Mm. Except he's better promoted at times, right? Uh, he wrote a few books. He wrote a few books. Mm. So this is the response. It's Michael W. from Columbus, Ohio wrote that. And it says, Dear Michael, no, there isn't a fine line between enlightenment and mental disorders. What you are dealing with is an esoteric or mystical isn't sorry isn't esoteric or mystical yet it isn't strictly speaking illness either many mental hospitals will not permit bibles in the wards because it is so common for the mentally ill to fixate on their inner illuminations such such fixations are a frequent aspect of manic states paranoia and schizophrenic breaks i thought that was kind of interesting 
is that if you start to read the Bible in current states of mind, then all of a sudden you'll go into a very, very, you'll, you'll, you'll derive different meaning from it, right? Mm. Um, you are right in a way that if you have been born in the East, your predicament would be viewed differently. You might have been labeled God mad, which sounds more tolerant. But in India, at least, the God mad are let loose on the streets and lead quite aimless and chaotic lives on the fringes of society. I am sympathetic with your desire to view your illuminated states as spiritual rather than psychiatric, but you fail to mention the side of your condition that has been brought that, that has brought you suffering. It makes me sad to tell you this, but mania doesn't cure depression. No matter how high you get, no matter how close to God and free of this earth, your flight, your flights are going to end in crashes, and I'm sure they already have. Manic states convince you that you have no problems, but that is an illusion. You need to take care of your condition medically. <laughs> that was interesting. interesting. I, I believe that if we had this discussion again and we had Daniel Fisher on, he wouldn't agree with this, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. When you find yourself in an elevated state, may I suggest you write down your experiences in a journal. Later, when you come back down to earth, read what you have written. If it still makes sense to you and feels meaningful, continue to journal and deepen your understanding. But if your journal entries look unrealistic, grandiose, or garbled, they may indicate your ecstasy is mixed with a good deal of agony. I wish you well. Love, Deepak. Interesting. Remember the show we did when we had that guest on um, recently, Chris Palmore? Yeah. And he said that he had these, what would he call them, manic fits, I think, or some term he used, I don't really remember. But yeah. um, um, grandiose ideas. Wow. He was like really grandiose, like living in this intense, intense state. Yeah. yeah. Um, I never, it, for Chris, I didn't see him feeling that that was enlightenment in any way. I think he said, hey, I just have to be cautious because that's in my DNA sort of thing. Yeah. So yeah, I, I found I found it interesting how Deepak addressed this one. And after hit, and hearing the the message from um, Daniel Fisher, you know, he, Deepak says, address it with chemicals. Daniel Fisher says, listen, you need to be in an environment that knows how to support you in a way through that process. Yeah. And I think that's a little bit of the point I was looking at um, hmm. in, in, when we started this is as you go through your own mental breakdown so you can reassimilate into a new reality, are you in a support group or in a society which can create space for that and knows how to support you there? Yeah. And, and it's not black and white, by the way. No. He also said, he's not saying no to meds, but it, it's that and. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Or. Yeah. And by the way, we can sort of, we have had a lot of comments come on, so it would be nice maybe to share some of those. Um, Jessica says there is a film which you may want to see. It's a nice movie that's called Crazy Wise. So go to www.ths forward slash forward slash <laughs> crazywisefilm.com. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you for recommending Daniel Fisher to come on. That was really nice. And this one's a bit of a long comment. So we'll just look at what she's written. Crazy or wise, the traditional wisdom of ind indigenous cultures often contradicts modern views about a mental health crisis it is a calling to grow or just a broken brain the documentary crazy wise explores what can be learned from people around the world who have turned their psyche psychological crisis into a positive transformative experience that's it nice. well if you look at daniel fisher that's what he's done he's taken his psychotic experience and i mean it also connects a little bit to my concept that i did with the wounded healer You've taken the thing that's actually been the the thing you had to, uh, you know, the your the dust in your clamshell that you needed to polish into a, into a pearl, and you bring that then to the world. Yeah. Um, Bolalong has a comment to to uh, Deepak. I'm completely with you, Bolalong. I didn't read his comment. What's Deepak, his comment? I often don't get exactly what he's trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of funny because you, you know about it. you spoke about it yesterday. I think. I, right? Well, I didn't speak about Deepak, but I spoke about 
when we went to the being there film with uh with peter sellers and we oh, talked yeah. enlightenment the whole concept is if you talk just vague enough enough people can interpret wisdom into it that they then all of a sudden come away thinking you're much more insightful than you actually are essentially right love it yes christina has been enjoying the shows lately she wrote me She's, so thank you wow. for that um so, Jessica, what I've learned from Dan, he is not anti-med. Sometimes they're very helpful. Yeah. I, I didn't have the idea he was anti-meds. I guess the reason I commented was Deepak was like, you've got to be medically treated. He was very clear on it. And instead of saying, <coughs> hey, maybe you might consider, that was a little bit of the, the thing that um, I thought was, uh, yeah. Hmm. So, and then, and then Christine said something else. I completely agree. The risk is when all the shift happens in isolation. And that's, and that's, the, that's the issue is that when one doesn't know how to ask for help and the surrounding group doesn't know how to support, you've got a dilemma on your hands. How can you support when the individual who's going through this psycho psychosis or this episode doesn't even know where to begin? Because they can't ask for help. Exactly. And so what do they do is they'll often call and then they'll get them medicated. The interesting story I mentioned earlier about this neighbor who Case would usually go to visit, have kind words, show love, show compassion. What mm. happens today is that same person is now acting out manically. Today he is. Yeah. And what, how they interact with him is they get the police involved, they record him, they actually they, they put more and more pressure on him almost encouraging him to be worse so they can use it against him. Yeah. yeah. And and he he's not very present to see what's happening. So he becomes uh, more manic yeah. and more aggressive. And then they use that against him. So in a way, how we've set up society is you're a bother to me, so I got to get rid of you. And unfortunately, that's why the system doesn't allow the space. And I think, I didn't tell you, but I, I, um, I have a new house that I got. A few uh, months ago, we know uh, I, I told you about the house, but I didn't necessarily tell you the neighbor across the way is somebody who's who's basically uh, socially supported. So they they got into an accident, they have brain damage, and they have real issues with cleanliness. And so when you walk in, the house smells a little bit because the person hasn't cleaned. Every six months, they bring a truck where he's a hoarder, and they'll pull everything out of his house every six months because he continues to hoard even though they clean the house up. And I, when I got into the house, I was like, oh no, I've got somebody over there that stinks. And it always, and then I didn't personalize him. I didn't give him an identity. And then one day I saw him in the hallway and I went right up to him and introduced myself. And, and I realized I saw the humanity in him. Mm -hmm. I saw the trying in him. I saw this loving energy. I also saw the manicness talking about neighbors that he hated and all of that. And I realized, wow, those neighbors, like Dan mentioned, didn't have the ability to connect with him. So I just showed him a lot of love, a lot of appreciation, a lot of understanding, and we created a very nice connection. And yes, the hallway smells a little bit. And actually, if giving him that love and support helps him thrive in society in the way he can, let, wouldn't that be a better world to live in? Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I kind of felt bad because I did also see that I at first didn't want to see him as a human because I didn't want it to smell. So I didn't actually connect to the person. I just said, oh, I bought a new apartment and I don't want it to smell. So in that way, there was a, there was a part of me that really didn't see him. And when I saw him, I must say, there was a, I felt love and that was really, I really felt beautiful. It's like, again, the world was flipped upside down and it made sense again. Beautiful, yeah. Andy. Yeah, that was really nice. Christina is sharing a few things today. Do you see anything that catches your eye? I witnessed this happening in my own family. People around are often so scared that close the dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, and then the person feels isolated, of course. Yeah, and then they feel isolated. Because when this consciousness opening is happening, the first emotional reaction is fear. Yes. Yeah, it was interesting, Christina. Like, I remember um, when... Um, so, Dad, you know, we talked about on the show, Dad was totally... Uh, bipolar and abusive as a kid. So as a kid, I was not able to deal with it and I deal with it in unconstructive ways. And what I noticed was this funny moment when I started to go see therapy in, in college, 
I started to get comfortable and and uh, more capable of dealing with all of the chaos. And what I saw the consequence you got, of you got therapy. Yeah, in 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 uh, in college, after mom died, and then I had to deal with dad. It was like I need I needed to to talk to someone. And it was in the in the book. Remember, she tried to hypnotize me and that that, that stuff. But what I thought was really interesting was that. Um, uh, where was I going? You're talking about dad. Yeah. Oh, when I healed myself, I was now an example and everyone saw that I was getting healthy. They started going to see psychiatry. <laughs> so there was like the, no psychiatry in the family, but it was like Andy went and he's now sort of functioning and he seems better than he was and everything. So all of a sudden they started seeing psychiatry, which is a really funny uh, evolution was, mm. you know, one person starts to get healthy and they are an example for everybody else. And how did that, how did that change your relationship with your father back then? Because it took you 10 years. Well, I mean, re remember that I was still in a relationship with my father until he disowned me. And that was a few years later. So, um, so, I mean, you know, if I look at the evolution, I think it's hard, you know, we discussed it before when you're, when you treat your parent, not as also a child, you get stuck. You, Cause I think there was this beautiful thing I posted on the, on the inspire vulnerability page on Facebook is that we forget that as children, we're watching our parents grow up, <laughs> right? Yeah. I saw that and it just hit me. It was so, and I think in a way, when you're young, you look at your parents and you hold them in size, such self-esteem. They're, they're the ones that you rock and they know everything. And I think the quicker you realize, oh shit, they're making it up as they go along like everybody else. Then all of a sudden you can treat them as other adults instead of, getting stuck in this codependent, I need you to be the type of daddy or mommy that you need to be so that I feel okay. Yeah. So, um, so uh, yeah, I don't know where, where I was going, but I think in that <laughs> way, uh, <coughs> I got comfortable with dad being dad. You know, when he would say horrible things about my mother, I, I wouldn't get triggered anymore. I was just like, wow, dude, you got some issues. <laughs> you know, I mean, that was the, and up to that point, he was like, oh, you're beating up this sacred woman, my mom, you know, the most pure, individual, you know, like I had all that stuff going on. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. The story that you shared earlier, um, when case, uh, beat down on you. Yeah. Um, like I had that moment with you, right. In, in the, in the workshop that we, uh, the 50 yeah. month course. Yeah. And in those 15 months, I think with Joan Luis, it was one of the worst. I, I, I was, I stayed upstairs. When you say worst. So let's make sure that oh, we say uh, I, like, the worst experience is not the worst trainers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she was one of the best. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I was shut down pretty much there. You also um, demonstrate, you also mirrored me in a yeah, way yeah. that was really ugly. And oh, that, really? And that was so hard for me to experience. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when I showed you the, that this, yeah, that was what Case did for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that wasn't easy, as you know, because in a way like i almost yeah. hit you <laughs> yeah you could have i mean i knew what i was doing i remember i remember seeing you taking the kleenex box and throwing it against the wall and i'm like oh shit we're moving in the direction that's going from anger to violence and what's that boundary and you know yeah. that was yeah so so this workshop guys was the one that really helped me um hmm well, how do I say it? And the, it's the, these 15 months really helped me uh, find peace. Yeah. Yeah. You couldn't love that part of yourself. Yeah. You judged it and you pretended that it wasn't that way, which is even harder because you couldn't even, couldn't even accept that that was who you were. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like sometimes when I think about the role that you played in those 15 months, I was yeah. like, like, um, like how much love you held in that space. It, mm. it, it's insane. I, I never felt so much love. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't easy, I can tell you. I know.
that's yeah. that's what uh, yeah. I felt. Yeah, there was that moment on that training specifically. I kind of was like, we're getting to that. We've set a, enough groundwork that we can take another step. Because uh, as a coach or a mentor, you're basically assessing how much pressure can this individual take and integrate it. Because my job as a coach or mentor isn't to push you, push you, push you. It's to give you enough so that you can swallow it, digest it, mm. and create another foundation. And I think that sometimes people try to, like, it's an egoic thing. A coach's job is like, oh, can I push him? Can I push him? Can I, you know, not actually saying, discerning, is this the right time to put on the accelerator or to let it go? Put on the accelerator or let it go? And I think that was that one moment I knew that if we didn't address the anger issue, that it would just continue, but it would be, uh, it would be acceptable. And I think after the, I think we got in nine months or something when this happened, this instance, it was like, this is the moment when we can no longer let this behavior be acceptable. Otherwise, it's just enabling it. We're now saying this is acceptable. Yeah. So yeah, that was an intense. Well, uh, you actually took me through three stages, I remember, if I'm right, right? I don't remember what the, was it? the first stage was if I'm if I get violent, yeah, relationship is over between us. Like yeah, that, yeah. that was a prerequisite for us working together. Yeah, people should know case died. You called me the day of the funeral. You said I've trashed my house. I uh I, I I'm on the verge of hitting the You called you know, me. Oh you but you asked me to call you. I didn't call you. No, Casper asked you to call me. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Oh, I, I was even know. surprised to get oh, a call from you. I don't you. even know. Yeah. Well, um, and then, and then, um, and then there was no exchange of money. There was nothing. So when when you say it, they got to understand the context. I said, I will work with you, but I have. I'm not getting paid for this. I'm not. So the one thing is, if you're violent, it's over. Yeah. It's over. Don't. I told you, don't even call me. <laughs> Be violent, and then don't call me again. But that's it. So yeah, that was the context. And. And back then, I, I was wild. Like I, I had no social understanding that I didn't have a problem with violence. Like that's what I grew up in, and for me, that was a normal thing, a, yeah. a way of being. Yeah. Um, and the, the second stage was at some point, mm -hmm. I was not. You, you told me from this point on, no anger. This was in the workshop. Okay. And that's where I learned if I don't jump to anger, I'm in pain. And then I started, like, I, I would make all these videos of me crying because, yeah. like, I wouldn't allow <laughs> myself to go into the anger. And I just started to discover, oh, fuck, every time I'm angry, I'm suffering. Yeah. But yeah, then yeah. I, but then I, I, got, but, I got stuck in that. Yeah, you did. You did. But I also wanted to, let's speak, because I like, well, now that we're talking, I want to be specific for, but the reason for this was because, you were not allowing yourself to feel the pain behind the anger. So when we said no anger, it wasn't really no anger. It's no ignoring the pain behind the anger, which is a different, this is a, you're not allowed to pretend like there isn't pain there. So you have to allow that pain in. That was it. Yeah. And that was like, uh, that was heavy. Yeah. You cried for months, not even weeks. <laughs> this went on for months. <laughs> Just months. It's like all the all the anger, all all the pain that I suppressed, uh, just yeah. poured out. And then the last stage was actually really grounding the whole experience. Yeah. And and not needing it to be anything more or less, actually. Yeah, and also no, and also acknowledging that anger wasn't a bad thing. Yeah. In fact, it was important. But now there was a difference between just being angry. And experiencing the anger in yourself, mm. which you didn't, you couldn't do that before. Yeah, you were just angry, and then that was okay because that's what you modeled after your dad or whatever was going on in, in the Cyprus at that time. Mm. Yeah, wow, it's beautiful. It sounds like you've got a CPR course in you right now. This is how it works, Bambos. Like he had his psychosis, and he said, "This is how I got out of it." And then people had their experiences. This is how I got out of anger. And then they create courses around it and then they screw it up the first three times and then they figure it out and then they become specialists because <laughs> no one gets it right the first time, you know, well, it took five years. Yeah. It was a five year journey, right? It was a five year journey. 
I didn't even want you in that course. That was the funny thing. <laughs> you like had the demand to get in. That was the, <laughs> you must've been so offended. You're like, Andy, I'm like, you're asking everyone to join your course, but not me. <laughs> 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 you, knew, you knew I was trouble. <laughs> exactly. I was like, oh, this is gonna be a but this is gonna be a bumpy ride, which it was. Uh, okay. Well, I think uh uh thank you for joining us. This is another beautiful episode of a wonderful cast. It's interesting to do a 30 minute segment and then have 30 minutes to discuss it. Mm. Actually, it's not a bad thing, but but with a guest, we could have talked an hour and a half with this guy. Yeah, he had a lot to say. He had yeah. a lot, yeah. Sweet. So I don't even know what the next show is, Bambos. I don't even care. Anything. But I don't think we should care. Um, don't do that. Don't do that because we have to do the oh, thing yeah. we always do. And Jessica says thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank it was you. Very much appreciated. If any of you listening have people that you know would be great to have on the show, then please let us know. We are looking for people with embodied experiences. Embodied experiences. That's what I would say. Not people that have things to sell or talk about, but people who have had experiences that they want to share. And then through those experiences, what they learned. And we're going to do that one. <laughs> <laughs> over and over again in this petty pace from the day on a wonderful chaos. Uh -huh.